Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? Nathan, I'm good. How are you? I am fantastic, and I'm super excited about today's episode. Just because of the pre-show talk, I cannot wait to hear what we've got lined up for the listeners today. So I'm going to play a fly on the wall and absorb as much of this conversation as I can and hand it over to you. Okay, well, let's get started. We've got a lot. You know, as copywriters, we draw inspiration and, and know-how from all kinds of sources, professional salespeople, music and musicians, the sports world, fiction, even the movies. But I have to admit, our guest today is the first copywriter I've ever heard of who draws her approach from The Simpsons. Yes, those Simpsons, Marge, Lisa, Bart, and of course, the most unforgettable one, Homer. Copywriter Sage Polaris has come up with an ingenious system for seeing the Simpsons as personality archetypes and using that viewpoint to reach more buyers in every promotion. Apparently it works too. Today she'll tell us how she used her system to write copy for a $1.25 million launch. Overall, Sage has written copy for more than 400 clients with millions more in sales results. Now, getting your copy to that level of performance is rare enough in and of itself, but bringing it into the frame of everyone's favorite cartoon dysfunctional family is unique, it seems to me. So. Before we take our little trip to Simpsons copywriting land, let us remember copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims and or if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, and business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So Sage, welcome and thanks for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to join this pantheon of legendary talent that you've had on your podcast. How many episodes deep are you now? Like hundreds? Yeah, I think we're, this is 267. Amazing. And I'm grateful to be 267. <laughs> Well, I, I'm grateful you're here too. And you know what? Um, I saw just just this morning, GQ has come out with an article that says The Simpsons is America's most influential sitcom. So I, I love the fact that you have picked a frame, a framework that is going to be so universally familiar. Now, I'm sure there are some people who you know, being stick in the muds will refuse to admit that they've watched episodes of Simpsons when no one else is watching them. But uh, just about everyone knows what it is. So uh, let, let's just start with your uh, your system. How do you use the these four main characters to classify buyers or prospects? Yeah, well, it just was dawning on me as you were saying this, actually, as I get into the system is that that show has been running for more than two decades. And I don't know many shows that can say that I, they may be the only one. Right. So I'm also realizing in my favor that who doesn't want that kind of longevity, especially in such a fickle industry. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. So we can learn from that as well. And so what I wanted to share with everyone today is specifically how you can apply this to your own copywriting, what they've done with these characters that you mentioned. And yeah. I did choose it because it's universal. I am a subculture girl, but I actually love that everyone knows what the show is. So that's why I chose it in the first place. That being said, there's something that happens with these four characters that you may or may not be conscious of. And it's funny, like as I share the system, you'll probably realize if you're a copywriter or if you want to use this to write your copy and you don't consider yourself a copywriter, you'll realize that you are doing some of the cues that I'm going to share. Um, you may have not been aware of it yet. So getting into it, let's start with Homer, who is 
the character on the show who's kind of like the party guy. <laughs> he's the dad, but he's also like so fun to be around. So when I'm writing copy, I I like to think about these four buyer types represented by the characters of The Simpsons. So Homer is the fun loving decision maker. When he lands on your sales page or he reads your Facebook ad or he reads your email, he's the one who's looking for the fun music lyrics, puns, things that catch his attention and keep him engaged. My friend is a Homer of the world, so they're the yellows. And uh, it's based on DISC, really, like the four personality types from DISC. So if you're familiar with that, you'll know that, you know, based on your personality type, people usually talk about it in regards to like hiring in their business or making sales. But I've talked about it specifically for copy. And so the Homer is um, the one who I gave my phone to my friend once and I was like, hey, look at my sales page that I just created. And she was scrolling through on mobile and I noticed like, when her attention would kind of wane, what kept her scrolling was when I had funny like things in the copy, like music lyrics or puns or those things. Like it kept her engaged and got her to look at the entire sales page, which I was proud of because I knew her personality type. I was like, I don't think she's going to make it through this whole sales page because it can be <laughs> rather long. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so it makes it really fun. And then, um, you know, even in my emails, I'll put GIFs. And those types of things are, first of all, eye-catching, but secondly, uh, they also keep the attention of someone who is more of a fun-loving decision maker. So that's homers of the world, and you want to make sure that you appeal to all four buyer types that I'm about to mention, including them. That being said, you may have an audience where you don't want all four colors, and we can talk about that a little bit later, but most people want to appeal to all four buyer types. So the next one we'll go to, unless do you have any questions about the Homer or do you uh, identify with the Homer, David? Um, you know, I do and I don't. Sometimes I am as serious as an undertaker, but there there is a Homer side of me for sure. Just can't help make a joke or 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 pull a prank or something. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's definitely I mean, even saying you're as serious as an undertaker, I mean, that's a joke in itself, right? I um, guess. Yeah. <laughs> That being said, um, let's jump to the Barts because um, they are the Reds in DISC, right? And so I don't follow DISC exactly, so let's stick with the Simpsons thing. But I do mention it because some people know that system. Um, that being said, the Barts, the Reds of the world, they are the fast decision makers. So when they land on your sales page, for example, they want a button at the top. Don't make them scroll to be able to buy the thing, right? Like. I usually put a button before they scroll right away to say like, join my thing now or sign up for this webinar now or whatever it might be the call to action, book a call, whatever it is. Um, and then usually I'll link that button. If it's a sales page where they're going straight to cart, where they can purchase from that page, um, I'll link it to the section that has the pricing. So it'll be an anchor link at the top, that button, and then I'll just take them straight to the offer and the pricing. And then they can go through and add it to their cart if they want. Um, but the thing to keep in mind about the Barts of the world, like they're the born leaders, the CEOs, like let's get it done, a million ideas a minute. Like every color too is interesting. Like they have their strengths and their weaknesses. They're not good at follow through necessarily, right? So they need other people around them um, when they are the CEOs of the world. Uh, that being said with the Bart, like have that button right at the top. The other interesting thing about them is having a testimonial right near the button will get them to like they already kind of know like gut decision i want to buy this thing from sage or david because like i already know but having that testimonial right near it actually helps them to decide even faster especially if it's a household name of someone they like recognize so let's say you were wanting to sell something to oprah and you had um gail her best friend a testimonial from Gail right under the button. Oprah would click it even faster because I imagine she's a red. Like she must be a fast decision maker, like go, go, go CEO, right? right. So um, having that. And then I asked someone who self-identified as a Bart or a red. I was like, yeah, what do you think with this having the testimony of the button? He's like, oh, yeah. And if you have it be my competition, I'll buy even buy it even faster because I always buy what my competition buys. And I was like, that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting i never heard that before that's really good yeah, yeah it was so cool to get into the mind of these people right yeah 
I mean, that's that's the other thing about using. I mean, what's more innocuous and non-threatening than a cartoon, which isn't even real people? So uh, it seems like you can get people really to open up a lot when when you're talking in this framework because their their guard is down. They're they're just you know sort of in a relaxed, casual mode. It's like they've had a couple drinks, even if they're stone cold sober. You know? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And it's like you instantly can start to rethink how you're writing your copy. In fact, I taught this once in a room and um, I was at someone's private mastermind, Rick Mulready, and mm. he asked me to come teach. That was a wild experience in and of itself. But as I was teaching it, someone was editing their Facebook ads. And in fact, wow. it kind of ties into, yeah, it was cool to see like instant action being taken. Um, it kind of ties into that whole, well, it does tie into that whole, like having that 1.25 million launch. Cause that person was in the room instantly editing as I was talking. And then he said nothing to me while I was at the event. He wrote me when I got home, like I was back at my copy headquarters here in Los Angeles. <laughs> and he was like, Hey, I, I instantly implemented what you taught and I got way better results with my cost per lead. So I want to hire you for a campaign. And I was like, okay, let's work together. So I can tell that full story, but maybe we should finish the two colors. But that's Yeah, let's, kind of let's finish the other two characters and, and then let's hear that. Yeah, yeah. So Marge is the blue. She's the deep connection decision maker. So for example, since we're talking about sales pages, when she lands on a sales page, she's looking for those deeper connection points through your story. She also loves strong branded visual imagery um, and copy that kind of weaves the imagery with the language, right? So she loves that experience of feeling deeply connected to you through those particular things. So you really want to appeal with to the blues, the margins of the world with having beautiful images. Um, and, you know, it's like I work with a lot of personal brands, so they're very visually driven people anyways. So really the blues love those kinds of touch points on a, even an ad, like I have an ad where there's a pen under my nose. And I'm I making saw that on your website. Yeah, that's, okay. kind of, that's kind of ballsy actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. But like the marges, literally I've had women who identify as like the blues marges of the world. She's like, that is why I hired you because of that picture which was taken by Misha Hetty, who's an incredible copywriter and photographer, by the way. Okay. Yeah, so those are the blues of the world. Do you feel like you have any blue in you, David? Oh, yeah. I mean, we talked about this before. In fact, you 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 identified me as um, yes. uh, mainly blue with a little bit of red. So I, I dressed appropriately today. <laughs> you for, really for did. Oh, yeah, I'm really into this. But, you know, I, I also... I mean, I can also see some Homer in me. I can see all four. And maybe that's just because I've done a lot of introspection and I'm introverted. But, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I definitely see some Lisa in me, too. I, but, but, yeah, I think, I think I'm mainly, mainly Marge. David the Marge. Okay. I love it. It's so good. So, yeah, that's the thing. Like, we have all four colors in us, and we change colors based on who's in the room, the type of buying decision that we're making, the price point makes a difference. You know, those types of things. Like, if you have a $27 product, you may not turn on, let's talk about Lisa, the green. Like, you may not turn on the Lisa and be very meticulous about your purchase. But if you're buying a $5,000 product, you might turn Lisa on us, which I'll tell you who she is and how she makes buying decisions. So yeah. she is the greens of the world and Lisa is very detail oriented. She is surrounded by lists. She loves making lists and the longer sales page is really for the Lisa's of the world. Like so many people ask me, especially the reds, they're always like, I would never read a long sales page. Do I really need this in my business? And I'm like, yes, if you want to attract and be inclusive of these different buyer types, you actually do. So Lisa will read your entire sales page, your FAQ, everything, and then she will write you and she will email you and ask you more questions. And I used to get annoyed because I'd be like, I did such a good job with the sales page. Like, why do you have more questions? Now I'm like, oh, this is the beginning of a sales conversation for you. This is how you start to decide to make the purchase. You need to know that it's Lisa's especially, they need to know that the product is specifically for them. 
So if you don't have language that right at the top of the sales page, for example, that identifies the audience, oh man, the leases will be like, I don't know, they'll be reading your sales page. Like, is this for me? Is this for me? Is this for me? And then if you do nail it with your copy and you make it very specific to them, uh, they still just need a few nuanced questions to be answered. And honestly, I'll take their email that they send me their question and I'll just add it to the FAQ for the next Lisa of the world. Who's going to be yeah. like, you know, they're going to, they're going to ask. So you might as well use that copy that they gifted to you basically by asking you questions. Oh, that's great. Um, good, good use of the information. Yeah. Yeah. You got to leverage it. Right. And so, um, this did for me take a lot of the burden off of like, having sales conversations with different personalities and me being the person that I am, I identify mostly as a Lisa and a green, but I will change my color. Like particularly now, like because we're doing this podcast and it's interactive, I bring my Homer out. Like I, you know, I bring that more like personality and laughter and those things that I think are important. So it's funny, like certain people, when they watch me present my full training on this, and they're looking at my slide deck and they're looking at how I'm presenting and all the things I'm doing, they get it. They know that I'm appealing to all four buyer types, even when I do presentations. And I love when they catch it and they're like, oh yeah, I see what you're doing there, Sage. And I'm like, yes, that is exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm appealing to all of these buyer types because I want all four in my community. Like I love the yellows, the homers who are always late to my Zoom, but the life of the party when they get there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I know what you mean. Yeah, I know that kind of person is. Yeah. Totally. Tell us about the a million dollar plus launch. Tell us about that one. Yeah. So that's the story I started to tell earlier. I was at Rick's event and it was a wild thing because Rick was like, will you come teach my community? And there was about 35 people in the room and it was his mastermind. And I was like, yes, I would love to come to San Diego and teach. And But they forgot to tell me who else was speaking at that event. So it was me, Amy Porterfield, Pat Flynn, and James Wedmore. And I was like, well, you could have mentioned <laughs> who, who the other speakers were. And then uh, I got there, though, and this this one client of Rick's like instantly started making changes to his copy, contacted me and said, hey, let's do a campaign. So our first campaign, we did one point two five million in a single launch. And it took us about six weeks of preparation. And I knew the misunderstanding that they had about their brand immediately because they were making their corporation kind of like um, the face of the business, right? Like this corporate identity. And I was like, no, you got to make the CEO the face of your business and have the emails come from your CEO as part of the sales process. So instead of like, let's just use an example, lead pages sending me an email. I was like, no, you want the CEO to be sending the email as though it is from them. And of course he was approving everything as we were writing the copy, but we were writing in his voice um, and using way more video of him. So all of these little touch points, we did a webinar. Um, we got 133,000 webinar registrants, which was phenomenal, but broke everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> it was an awesome problem to have. That's what I kept saying to his team that I was working with. Like, this is a great problem to have. We will get through this. Um, and then we sold an $11 per month subscription and we got 1.25 million in sales, which also broke Infusionsoft because they were using that as the gateway to get through to it. It was just the whole thing. But wow. I loved that project and it was showing the power of like the simpsons method or policy for you know closing more clients we made sure that we appealed to all four buyer types and we made sure that we used the ceo as the personality of the brand instead of just some made-up name of their company that's that's really great so how do you know when to write to all four Simpsons, and how do you know when to write to just one or two buyer types? That's a great question. So let's say your company, like you're a, a, C, a coach for CEOs, right? Like in that case, you only want reds in the room, right? Like the Barts of the world. Because if you put Lisa's and Greens in a room with a bunch of Barts, they'll eat, them, eat the Lisa alive, to be honest. Like they're so fast, they're so go-go that it would just slow the whole room down. 
And there's nothing wrong with the slower decision makers, but you need to be aware of that when you're building your audience. Like, who do you want in the room? And make that conscious decision about who you want to appeal to. So for those particular clients that I have that only want to lead other CEOs, they're like a trainer for CEOs, don't appeal to those other buyer types. Keep your sales pages short. Um, have the call to action button right away. Like do all those things that really appeal to the Barts of the world and forget the rest because we get so distracted by what works for other people. And I often have to remind them that like your brand is not someone else's brand. You might see them doing something. And first of all, you don't even know if they're just testing something to see if it works or if it's actually proven. But second of all, if you're not considering the people that you actually want in the room, then you're making a huge mistake here. And the other thing about like, let's say you want to attract CEOs and train them specifically, you've got to be 100% yourself and show up exactly who as who you are because they pick up and sniff that out right away and they won't buy. You have to really be sure of yourself for that type of community to buy from you. Okay, that's that's really good. And let's let's um get beyond sales pages to paid traffic uh to organic traffic um yeah. to to your facebook group things like that i mean how does this all fit in yeah so for me like i have 75 percent of my audience comes from organic traffic and 25 percent comes from paid traffic and i will say that 25 percent paid traffic can be quite fickle with my launches like one year it'll work and then facebook will change something and then and instagram will change something and the next year i'll have to tweak it and get it to work again so that being said like I think the paid traffic muscle is overflexed, honestly. So I'd rather focus on organic traffic right now and talk about what I've been doing there. So I am a part of a, quite a few Facebook groups that allow promotion. Either you pay to be able to promote in there or they just generally allow people to promote their business in there. So I go in when I'm getting ready. Like, for example, I have a May launch coming up. So my job, my main job is to go in and give value to these groups. I'm not always trying to get them to, to buy something or to take the action, like sign up for my beta filming. Sometimes I'm just going in there and I'm appealing to those four different color types. So in a Facebook group, for example, with the Marges, I'll tell a deeper story about my business and maybe leave them off with an instructive thing that they can immediately use strategically in their business that I've proven in my business. So it'll be a longer post and the image has to be on point for those blues, the margins of the world, right? So maybe the pin under my nose or a picture of me. I live in LA. Um, I get really cool photos. Like I have a picture of me um, with books above my head. It's like an arch of books at the last library in downtown LA. I'll use something like that because I know yeah. it'll catch their eye and then they can't resist the story. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's that's really good. Well, we're we're just about out of time, but you have a special offer um, increasing email open rates, right? For for our listeners. Yeah, I would love to share that. Thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to share it. So sure. if you have an email list and you've ghosted them, because that happens to the best of us, I have a triple email open rates. And if you go to sagepolaris.com slash David Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> sageblaris.com slash david rocks wow i love that why do i love that i don't know it sounds so nice it's so good so if you go there there's three emails that you can copy paste and personalize if you go stick your list you'll send it to them and they will be able to you'll be able to re-engage with your list but also make an offer that you know will land because you do a little market research with those emails to find out what people actually want if you've been in business a while, I want to ask you a question. When is the last time you have scrubbed your email list? The triple email open rates templates will help you do that. If you have not done that in the last year or even the last 90 days, these three emails will allow you to scrub your list and get the people who are not engaging off of your list. So you stop paying for them to squat on your list. That sounds great. That sounds really good. So sagepolaris.com forward slash David rocks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Before good. we're out of here, I want to jump in real quick. Something that you said, first of all, everything that you said during this is 
this is my favorite episode of the podcast so far. <laughs> um, but Hello. one thing that one thing that you guys were talking about the how all of us have a little bit of each character in us, depending on the situation. And mm-hmm. I have noticed that depending on where we're at in the relationship, the customer journey, as mm-hmm. as to, or as they say, um, different personalities will come out. I think of it like in a relationship when you're first with somebody, if they engage to you on, on the third date, you're like, whoa, this is moving way too fast. I need to run as far away as I can. If they wait until about a year, if that's where you're comfortable and you're like, yes, I, this is the perfect time to ask. But then if they wait two years, three years, they're like, when is this person going to finally commit to me? So presenting the, the red offer, the I'm going to buy right now, sometimes People will be that Bart Simpson at different points. After a long, very informative webinar, if I send somebody to a long, drawn-out sales page, it doesn't right. convert as well. But if I send them to a Bart Simpson sales page, it usually converts better. So I wanted to get your thoughts on just that idea of along the journey with you, the different aspects of the character of the different characters coming out. Yeah, Nathan, this is so good because I actually prefer to slow down the sale. The Lisa in me comes out, right? Like if I have a high ticket offer and I want people to buy, but I give them an opportunity to respond like a Bart, that's sometimes a mistake because they don't know me well enough. They don't get the value yet of what I offer. I would rather slow them down and wait for them to buy from me. So I do think that like in that case, let's say someone's relatively new to you, if you have the ability to personalize the pitch with like a book a call button instead of going straight to cart, that would be better because then you can truly qualify them or have a really good application between you and the potential client. Because without those pieces, I found that like if they even if they say yes and they work with me and let's say they buy my my $10,000 VIP day as an example, If they don't know me well enough and I don't know them well enough, that often ends in shambles. And I don't want that for me or them. Like I want people, we often think about, oh, I really want this sale. Like I want to make this money. But then what we don't think about is like, is this person actually qualified to work with me? Maybe I shouldn't be taking their money, right? Because I'm interested in being in business for another 10 years. I've already been in business for a decade. So I want another decade. And if I want that, it's repeat clients is a big part of that. So I think we have a responsibility to understand the buyer types and to sell to them responsibly. Nice. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to double that. This has been my favorite episode of the podcast so far. David, thank you so much for booking Sage as a guest. And one more time before we're out of here, where can people go if they wanted to get this uh, triple email offer that you've got going on? The best link on the planet, sagepolaris.com slash David Rocks. <laughs> nice. And if you enjoyed this episode and you want to catch more episodes just like this one, maybe not quite as good, but very close to as good as this one, make sure that you're subscribed over at copywriterspodcast.com. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Sage. Bye.